services could have come in and talk to you? There was a report that came into child protection. Do you have any math in the house right now? No, we don't. The reality when you work in child welfare is that you're working with families that are experiencing a significant amount of trauma. You're thinking about people's lives, and so helping to make those decisions is a pretty important job. I think a lot of people don't realize that we're making those decisions on a daily basis. Working with kids and families that really need our help at sometimes the darkest moments in their lives. It's emotional. It's extremely rewarding, but at the same time, it will be the most difficult job you'll ever do. Child protection professionals in Minnesota work to ensure the safety, permanency, and well-being of children. They play a critical role in helping families create the stable and nurturing homes children need if they are to thrive. Minnesota is a state-run, county-administered child protection system. The Department of Human Services works with Minnesota's 87 counties, 11 federally recognized tribes, and community-based providers to support interventions that ultimately strengthen families and prevent child maltreatment. This video is designed to give you a realistic look at child protection employment in Minnesota. Having an informed and committed workforce contributes to the safety and well-being of children involved in child protection. Research has shown that high turnover in child protection staff leads to more instability for children and families. Before accepting a job in child protection, it's important to consider your fit with the benefits and challenges of the work. Child protection professionals work in a broad spectrum of roles across a wide variety of state and local agencies. Watching this video will give you a feel for the skills and temperament required to be successful in this challenging field. If you're going into child welfare practice, you need to know that it isn't just children you're working with, you're working with the family that that child is in and helping those kids to be as safe and healthy as they can in their environment. We're here to help support families be the best families they can be in the situations that they're in. You're not going to fix people. You're not going to save people. You're going to give people an opportunity to make different choices. You're going to give people an opportunity to make their own changes. They might not be a rock star parent at the end, but they might meet the standards, the minimum standards, and the child might be better off and safe. And that's really what it comes down to. The work within Child Protective Services requires professionals who can be empathetic, can be engaging, can develop relationships and trust and get underneath um, what's being talked about and behaviors that they're seeing to the real core issues that a child or a family may be experiencing. And then to take that information and to be able to work with someone to develop a meaningful intervention that's going to leave a child and a family better off. Um, that's ultimately what we're trying to do and that's ultimately what we need professionals who are doing this work to be able to do. Chisagan County Intake, this is Bill. Yep, this is Child Protection. Each year in Minnesota, approximately 25,000 children are reported for abuse and neglect to the child protection system. People whose jobs involve caring for children, such as doctors, teachers, and therapists, are required by law to report suspected child abuse or neglect. It is child protection workers who evaluate these reports and then work to support the families involved to ensure safety for children. The phones ring all day long and could be anything, large volume, right, of looking at allegations, making determinations based on the information and the law and the criteria. Each report is received through our intake worker, and then those reports are screened on a daily basis. We compared uh, the statute uh, on does this, is this allegation meet the statute that the state has put out uh, as guidelines for abuse. We use that with every single report we receive to determine if our agency needs to be involved in it what level. The power to the home had been shut off. Um, they contacted us. When a report again, of child abuse has been made, a team of child protection workers will immediately decide which reports require further action. Those that do will be screened in, and the team will then prioritize and determine what level of response is required. 
There are domestic violence concerns on a regular basis. Sometimes there's parents actively using illegal drugs in the home, and sometimes there's sexual abuse. If a call comes into intake and there's a situation that needs to be immediately addressed, um, we all take turns being on what's called emer on emergency coverage. Um, and if something comes in on your, on your coverage, then you're the person that's going to get it, and the point is to act immediately on that. she admitted to using meth? Yeah, that's the report we got. When a report comes in that a child's safety is an imminent concern and meets other statutory criteria, it will require the family investigation response. We're walking into a situation and we don't know what's there. It's different every time and it can be kind of scary. It can be kind of unnerving, anxiety provoking. You don't know what you're walking into. Anytime uh, we are concerned about the safety of our worker or the safety of a family, sometimes it's been a domestic violence scenario or illegal drugs in the home, law enforcement and the social worker go out on those together. Child protection investigators will take whatever action may be required to ensure the child's safety. Okay. Okay. Do you guys have any other questions for me right no. now? No. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, you guys. I know. Just a very intrusive process because we don't need releases, we don't need their permission. We're able to get any of that information we need and then to try to continue to work with that family and help them. You really have to approach carefully and try to keep the peace while getting the information you need for, to help the kids. Understand that just your presence as a child protection investigator, the fact that you're knocking on their door has an impact on a family. And you're going to ask them incredibly incredibly personal questions. You're going to get in the depths of the worst time of their life. How you present to them is going to make a huge difference uh, about, and, and ultimately you're, you're there because you want to make sure that child, those children are safe and then help change the situation. He, they have a really good relationship, the dad and the son do. The mom's in prison. And so that may also have an impact on um, the children's ability to be in school. When a report does not meet statutory requirements for an investigation response, a child maltreatment report may be assigned the family assessment response. Child protection professionals will interview children, parents, and others to assess for safety risk factors, and family strengths and needs. Asking a lot of questions, listening, explaining our perspective, explaining the report that we received, explaining what our concerns are, and then talking about how can we mitigate those concerns. I work with families on services that could help them get past whatever allegations were presented to us. I had a recent case when there was issues with domestic violence that was reported to us. We went in the residence, kind of scoped it out, and we were able to talk through what was happening and figure out some services to help her with. Because there was some concern about her daughter witnessing a lot of, a lot of domestics, because when we were there and um, people were raising their voices, she did this mm -hmm. with her ears, which is a pretty big indicator that she's probably heard a lot of screaming before. Um, so getting her, her little girl some services, and she had a new baby in there too. So um, looking at getting public health in there as well to make sure that child development is on track and make sure there's no safety issues in the house and, and things like that. Always assess for safety, um, refer clients for services, provide any type of support that would alleviate any safety concerns as far as child protection is concerned. In the matter of the welfare of the children of Justin Johnson and Christine Anderson. I will defer to the social worker to provide more information for the court. Thank you. Go ahead. Your Honor, the two children were involved during the execution of a search warrant. The condition In the some cases, children may need to be removed from dangerous situations and placed in foster care until a court decides the best way to provide them with a safe, nurturing, and permanent home. And work with social services as to visitation. Oftentimes we need to involve the court. Um, uh, there's something called the CHIPS, Child in Need of Protection 
or services, and that is a court proceeding that we follow. If a child is in out-of-home placement um, due to safety reasons, um, we always have a CHIPS and court involvement in those cases. Having a good relationship between the child welfare worker and the families they work with really helps paint a good picture for the attorney to make the decision about whether a CHIPS petition is needed in court. The more information that we get from the social worker, the better informed we are and the better decisions we can make for families. The child welfare worker will take the information that they have garnered through their investigation and integrate it into a plan. And it's a plan that is articulated clearly to both the judge and the, um, the family that is at issue. It's one of the most difficult pieces for child protection workers because as a child protection worker, you're a social worker. You're there to help and assist families. You're looking to provide families and children with the services they may need to be healthier families. And the court process, bringing a family into the court process can be frustrating for the family. They're upset and they should be upset. They just had their children removed from them and they're being brought into court um, and they don't feel, you know, all the time that you're on their side when you do that. Yeah, it can be difficult working in the system. Um, you may not get the result that you're looking for and you have to be okay with it. That's why we have the system, that's why we have the courts, and that's why we don't make the decision. The court needs to hear everybody's facts and everybody's information and make the system that make the decision that they think is right. It may not be what the worker thinks is right, and that can be really difficult. Family investigations and assessments are completed within 45 days. Some cases conclude an assessment, you know, determination, yes or no, no services needed, can close that way. Some cases go on to case management, either with court involvement or voluntarily. Because uh, of the way that child protection is portrayed in the media, it's often believed that child, the role of child protection is to remove children. Um, and that's not true in the majority of, of cases. And always the role of child protection is to reunify children with their families and to support families whenever possible. His DC 0 to 3 assessment diagnosed him with anxiety. So that there Regardless of outcome, the goal of child protection workers will be to try to first work with the child's family to ensure a safe environment. Usually, an ongoing child protection case manager will be assigned to the family, and they will work together to resolve whatever issues are contributing to an unsafe situation. My role is to do all of the ongoing child protection case management. If it's a placement case, I keep it through when permanency is reached. In a placement case, that means that the child is in the custody of the county, and we're working a case plan with the parents to reunify um, the child with them. The goal of Child Protective Services is always to keep families together whenever possible. Research shows that children do better if they can remain with their parents. After a case is opened, parents must demonstrate that they're willing and able to ensure their child's safety. To do that, a case plan is created that includes specific goals and a time frame for completion. Case plans are very extensive. Um, they involve safety, well-being, and permanency, which are the three categories of child protection. And within each category, there's different tasks for the parent to do, as well as the child. And it, it takes a lot of work. The case manager will monitor the family's progress and try to keep them on track. I have six months to get this family to get over something that they've probably been doing for 20 years. Sometimes they're going to fall short, and sometimes they're going to be successful. So oftentimes it's just about the communication and, you know, developing a rapport with people. Just say, hey, what do you need from me to help you be successful? I won't drive the bus for my clients, but I'll, tour, I'll be the tour guide. They have to do the work. Otherwise, they don't develop an independence that will lead to success. The worker may connect the family with other community resources, like chemical health facilities, housing agencies, early childhood family education, and will also collaborate with counselors and therapists to help parents deal with whatever issues are challenging their children's well-being. We had a case 
where we removed three children, struggled tremendously with the parents. They, they weren't um, understanding the need to make changes. There was a multitude of their mental health issues, there were drug issues. We ended up terminating all parental rights for all three of those children. Mom gets pregnant comes back to us again because we've terminated, she did really well. The time we spent stabilizing mental health and chemical dependency, we'd already done that. So we were able to start in a different place this time. And we were able to start uh, with parenting education and with public health. So I think it had a rough ending in one respect, but then they came back around and they did really well and they actually did. Uh, we filed the chips and we worked through the whole plan, but they got to keep the, the last child. I just saw them at a recent county event and they chatted with me for a while about it. They were pretty excited. It involves a lot of communication, a lot of team meetings and collaboration um, and being really clear about whose role is what and a lot of times we're able to back out and allow that support to continue without child protection being involved. Each of Minnesota's counties is unique in terms of diversity, size, economic disparity, and available local resources. Chisago County is a more rural county. We don't have the services other people have, and it's harder to coordinate everything. We serve about half of our population, actually, between all of our programs. We're a small, poor county, so we serve quite a few people through our agency. In a smaller county like this one, the case manager does everything. There is a little bit more variety, I think, working here, and I like that. Being in Hennepin County, there is a lot of service providers that are available. We have a very culturally diverse population that we work with. So there's different providers, culturally specific providers for pretty much every service we provide, which includes parenting education, um, domestic violence programming, there's chemical treatment, therapy, um, and a lot of times we can at least provide somebody who fits culturally, but also linguistically. So if somebody speaks something differently, then we're able to provide them services in their first language as well. The Hinbank County has worked aggressively to build um, a workforce that looks like the clients that we serve. And you need that diversity because of language, because of culture, because you understand things at a whole different level when you're working with families from a cultural perspective. When we look like them, then we can better serve them and the families really believe that we're committed to their best interests. And quite often with child protection, um, it, they're diverse situations and it, to make the best team decision possible, it's, it's great to have people from different backgrounds. I believe the skills that are really essential are a recognition of one's own uh, stereotypes um, and values right? that may have an impact on your ability to be fair and objective um, and equitable right, in the decisions that you're making. I want someone that's compassionate, someone that has good empathy, um, someone that's understanding of life and client situations that's not judgmental, um, someone that's welcoming of all types of families. In Minnesota, we have a long history of um, disparities, particularly with our African American and uh, American Indian families in our state. Um, and what that means is that they are often overrepresented um, in our system. So we have been working, partnering with our communities, partnering with our workforce, and trying to figure out what are, uh, are all of the ways that we can start approaching this topic because it's not um, one solution, it's a systemic. Um, pervasive issue that we need to really attack from many angles and we need to look at um, all of the opportunities available to us to address the disparities in our system and try to turn the tide. Knowing that Minnesota has some of the worst disparities in the nation in both the African American and American Indian communities, um, having workers understand those communities, have relationships in those communities, be from those communities, is really essential in us being able to address disparity and disproportionality. When cases involve Native American families, workers are required by the Indian Child Welfare Act, known as ICWA, to involve the family's registered tribe in all decision-making. Tribal child protection workers are professionals who have important roles and responsibilities in these cases. The goal is to keep American Indian children with American Indian families whenever possible. It's very important information as to whether the child has Native American heritage, whether there is an affiliation right, of membership right, in, with a tribe. So we have to um, 
consult with the tribe often, collaborate with the tribe. Um, we don't make decisions with regard to placement or permanency without the tribe being consulted and being on board. We've had great relationships with the tribes in the state, and they have social workers that they also assign to the case, and we end up teaming it. At every stage, child protection work presents many challenges. Workers need to be able to recognize their own personal biases and develop empathy with their clients. They need to deal with disappointment and disagreement. They need to have the professional skills to navigate the court system, law enforcement, and documentation requirements. And they need the dedication and determination to persist despite heavy workloads and time constraints. In child protection, there's no such thing as a typical day. And you don't know what it's going to be like when you get in. Your day will never go just as you had planned it or just as you had scheduled that you have to be ready to jump from one task to another task. The regulations regarding paperwork and documentation really take up a lot of time. You're doing paperwork, you're doing background checks, you're doing all of this kind of stuff because you have to gather the information. And what you do, you have to write it down. Write down every single thing that you do. There's never enough time in the day. And I, you know, the social workers, they work very hard. The caseloads are high. Everything is so fast paced and changes so quickly. You've got scenarios coming at you from all different angles that you don't know the answers to. In Minnesota and nationally, research has shown that one of the primary reasons that child protection workers leave their roles is because of bureaucracies. Workers, in my experience, that have been successful in their roles have done that because they figured out how to stay true to the core work of child protection with children and families and doing that while still being bound by statute, regulations, and rules. You need to be organized and be able to prioritize. Uh, and it is a high stress, fast environment. So you have to be able to roll with the punches. You would have kids crying, parents crying, everybody uh, thinking that, you know, uh, you are not there to serve the family, but you're there to break up the families. It, it's always hard. I don't think anybody can ever get used to doing that. You can't take things personally. You just can't. And it is really important for the child protection worker to, to be able to still try to engage and not back off because of the discomfort of dealing with an, a hostile family. Probably the most important skill is um, being a good listener, an active listener, and um, I think just person-centered, always, always trying to see and hear from the person where they're at because each family that we serve is different. Minnesota gives employees who are new to child protection work as much preparation, training, and support as possible. Just started in the field less than, well, two and a half months ago, actually. So it's everything is extremely brand new to me still. I'm still doing a lot of uh, training, a lot of reading. At the state, we operate the Minnesota Child Welfare Training System, and and the, the purpose of the training system is really to provide support to workers, particularly new workers who are coming in. All new child protection workers across the state need to have uh, what we call foundation training, so a basic kind of understanding and uh, theoretical background as well as specific practice um, policies and methods that workers need to know right off the bat. I was signed up for a lot of um, online trainings and even classroom trainings, but the best trainings that I've gotten are just the shadowing and just being able to go out with a lead social worker and just see how they handle it. There's always backup. If I have questions on anything, they're always there. I, there's been times where I've been out in the field and stuff would come up and I just was like, what do I do? And I was able to call my supervisor and she was able to walk me right through it. So yeah, I've always had that support. I have routine supervision with my workers. I meet with them at least every other week. I have an open door policy. Workers can come in and talk to me whenever they want to about a case situation. But we for sure sit down every other week and go through the entire caseload. Sometimes the newer social workers um, are not used to that level of supervision. But it's very important. When you're in the child protection field, you want somebody to be reviewing your work 
all the time because it's you out there in the field and you want somebody to be knowing what is going on. You want somebody to have your back. Be open to learn and to grow. Expect that it's going to take two years to get up to speed when you start a brand new position. It took me like at least a year, year and a half to get to that point where I felt comfortable, where I didn't feel like I have to ask my, you know, my supervisor or lead worker, like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Uh, when folks have been in the field for a couple of years, they kind of get a better sense of what it is that they don't know or, or skills that they'd like to develop. And we try to have a a great um, catalog and complement of trainings available for them as well. Ongoing staff development is really important in child protection services and um, that's something that we strive to do within the training system as well. Keep curricula and um, trainings offered at a pace that allows people to continue to develop themselves professionally, um, expand their skill sets, um, to go deeper into issues that are of interest to them. For those who have made a commitment to child protection work, the rewards are unsurpassed. My most favorite part about it is just seeing changes in families. That is the one thing that probably keeps me going, is seeing somebody make progress. And they're, they're happy about it, and they're, they're, it's just so life-changing. Maybe we make a safety plan to keep those kids safe and to get an offender out of the home, to get an abusive person away from the kids. We help them get orders for protection. We help them get to domestic violence shelters. We help people get into treatment. We help people to get into parenting and anger management and all of these things that are helping to better their lives. And they do get their kids back or keep their kids. At the end of the day, when I know a child is someplace safe, that gives me fulfillment. To connect with people, to empathize with them, to offer them services and support, to explain why or why not services are provided, to be able to make that process as informative and as fair and as helpful as possible is, is really, really good work. So despite it being difficult, um, it's the best job I've ever had. The most rewarding part of, of being in this field are the people and the families and the children. Um, even if the end is not great, even if you terminate parental rights, to see that child go through the process and be adopted and to see them, and I say this to my staff, be the star of their own show and get to have a family where they, they are number one, there's nothing that beats that. Despite the rewards of positively impacting a child's life or helping a family grow stronger, the physical and emotional challenges of child protection work are significant. Working in child protection is potentially the best experience in the entire world. There is nothing I would rather do than this. There are also times when it is the worst experience and it breaks your heart and you feel like you are just, you want to give up. You cannot detach your emotions from this job. Um, it's impossible to, to believe that you're going to go home and not think about these children and families when you're not on the clock. Dealing with kids that are being abused at different levels, certainly the sexual abuse, can be very emotionally trying. When you're dealing with crisis after crisis after crisis every single day, um, it can wear you down. And you have those days where you, you have tears. You sit in your boss's office and you cry. You have to be able to talk with other people about what's going on. You can't, it's all confidential stuff. You can't talk, you can't go home and talk to anybody. You can't go talk to your friends about it. Your colleagues are the ones that you have to be able to kind of process things through, who understand what you're, um, kind of what you're going through. So in a sense, you have to stay very vulnerable and open, but at the same time, to avoid burnout, you have to protect your heart. You can't take this home with you. But what you do is you give all of yourself, 100% when you're at the job, but you keep family, your family, your personal life separate from the work that you do here. The more balanced you stay as a worker, which means taking care of yourself first, the better job you can do when you're working here. When you're on an airplane, when the mask drops, they tell you to put your mask on first before you help those who are with you. That's what you have to do here to be able to endure and persevere and stay long in this career. 
you have to take care of yourself first. Secondary traumatic stress, burnout, compassion fatigue, it goes by a number of names, but what we know is that child protection workers experience all of these things. So finding ways for workers to be able to take care of themselves, seek the support that they need, and most importantly, having agencies that can provide that concrete support for the workers doing the work is essential. Do your friends typically bring methamphetamine to the home? Your attorney will be there. Child protection is a career. It's not a job. It's a commitment. This is something that you have to have a passion for. It's something that you feel strongly about. You will be very happy at times. You will be very sad. You will be mad. And you could all have all of that within like two hours. We are here for the children and for the families. And we're not here to fulfill our own whatever dream we have of saving the world. Because child protection is not saving the world. Child protection is making sure that children are safe and families are successful. No college class really prepares you for the people and the scenarios that you're going to deal with. But I think in your heart of hearts, if you love people and you want to help people, it is a great profession. We hope this video has given you a new appreciation for the challenging and valuable work done by the dedicated people who staff Minnesota's child protection system. If you're thinking about making a career in child protection, having a realistic idea of what's involved will help you make a better decision. And if you do decide to enter the field, knowing what to expect will improve your chances of success.